This is the last of the series of, of classes that we've had that relate to global poverty and effective altruism. Uh, career choice was also part of that. So it's wrapping up another of the sections of the course. Um, we will be going on to talk about climate change, which of course does have connections with global poverty, as we'll talk about, but it is really a separate issue. What I want to do today is to talk about this rather separate argument about global poverty that is particularly associated with the philosopher Thomas Poggi, who's uh, currently a professor at Yale University. And um, I'll go through that, but I think it won't probably take us the whole class, so I want to allow a bit of time for your comments and discussion on the larger topic that we've been talking about. Uh, we had a number of guest speakers in that part of the course, and that means sometimes that although we, we had discussion, that maybe you didn't get chances to ask some of the things about the general argument. So um, let's hope we, we have some time for that discussion. So this is a distinctive argument, which is about, not about, I've been arguing in terms of what are our obligations, being affluent and given the possibility that we can assist the people in extreme poverty, uh, what are our obligations to do so? I haven't talked about rights um, or rights violations, and some people may think that that's a more promising approach to this issue and wonder why not. So here I'm exploring that particular approach. And when you can do that, you can start with this document, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, obviously an extremely well-known international document, perhaps the best known international document uh, relating to rights, um, dating, dating back from the period immediately after the Second World War. Um, set up a number of, of rights and in connection with discussion of global poverty, it's Article 25, Section 1 that really sets out the claim that there are these uh, rights that are universal, that everybody has, and they include a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of uh, oneself, one's family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, necessary social security services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Um, so this is extremely sweeping. And a lot of people have said, well, um, if you're going to say that's a human right, then uh, where does that come from? And, and uh, who is supposed to be violating it? If, as obviously is the case, a lot of people in the world don't have this. They don't have this adequate standard of living. They certainly don't have uh, security in the event of unemployment or sickness or disability. These are things which really only people in uh, affluent countries have. And um, so how can we claim, you know, who is supposed to be providing these rights to people? Um, and, you know, that leads people to say, look, we ought to make an important distinction when we talk about rights between uh, positive and negative rights. And um, this right to food and, and adequate standard of living and health care and so on, they're positive rights and they're different because nobody, it's not obvious who violates them. So you can take a negative right like the right to free speech. Um, if you write an article criticizing the government and you live in a country uh, where the government is likely to arrest you and lock you up for doing that, um, then it's perfectly clear who has violated your rights. In this particular case, the government has violated your right to free speech by locking you up because you wrote something critical of the government. Um, and individuals, not the government, could violate your rights to free speech too. And in fact, it's happened to me on a couple of occasions um, when I've tried to give a lecture, not recently, but about 20 years back in, uh, in Germany in particular, because my views on euthanasia were uh, 
regarded as very provocative, and there were groups of people who tried to prevent me speaking, and actually, in fact, succeeded on a couple of occasions by um, blocking the doors of lecture theatres or coming armed with whistles so that I couldn't be heard. So I would say they were, you know, those specific people who did that, who organised that, um, were violating my rights to free speech. But um, it's much harder to say who is violating a positive right um, if you don't have uh, a right, if you don't have enough to eat, as, as happens in many poor countries. Um, it's, it could be, of course, that you actually grew enough food for yourself and somebody, again, it could be the government or it could be um, uh, somebody else, uh, could be a roving band of militia, perhaps, if you're in a country with that, uh, that kind of um, law and order, uh, took your harvest from you. So, okay, then it's pretty clear that they've violated your rights to food, but we might say simply they violated your rights to property. This was your property and uh, they took it from you. But that's a special case. If, in fact, um, the rains failed and you're hungry because, although you planted your crop, uh, it shriveled and died in the heat, and therefore you have no food, then it's much less clear who might have violated your right or, or how that could have been done. So that's a distinction between positive and negative rights, and a lot of people say we ought not to violate people's negative rights. They have rights to whatever it might be, to life, various liberties, and so on, um, and you can tell who violates them. But positive rights are different, and some people would say, in fact, they're more kind of rhetoric or aspirational about things that we would like to see rather than things that we regard as rights violations. And um, that goes along with a general argument of a libertarian kind, of which I've given you one example here by a Canadian philosopher called Jan Navison. So libertarians typically believe that uh, nobody should violate our rights um, in the sense of those negative rights, and that includes rights to our property, but we don't really have positive rights. And here's a, a statement by Narvison to that effect. He says, I'll take it as given that we're certainly responsible for evils we inflict on others, no matter where, and that we owe these people compensation. Nevertheless, I've seen no plausible argument that we owe something as a matter of general duty to those to whom we've done nothing wrong. So in other words, he would be saying, if there are people who are starving because the, their crops have failed or just they have very little land and they can't grow enough, or the soil is poor, um, then Narvison's saying, I've seen no plausible argument that says we owe something as a matter of general duty to them because we've done nothing wrong to them. We have not inflicted an evil upon them, is the kind of thing he's saying. We've not Perhaps we've had no contact with them at all, in fact. So if we had no contact with them, then Narvison would say, how can we have done something wrong with them? How could I have done something wrong to a person in uh, a, a poor country who I've actually had no contact with at all? So here's Poggy's response to this. Um, he wants to have a notion of what it is to violate a human right that is sensitive to this criticism that um, I can't be blamed because the rains failed and somebody is hungry in, let's say, Mali. Um, so he says, yeah, okay, a human rights violation is not like that. It's not, his example is perhaps even more bizarre, um, the destruction of a town by a meteorite, um, or even culpable failures to give enough aid or enough protection. So he would say the, the kind of things that I've been talking about and saying we ought to if we're affluent, we ought to assist people in global poverty. He would, he would say, well, yes, you know, he doesn't disagree with that. I've had, um, I've had discussions with him. We've been on the same platform at conferences discussing global poverty. And his view of the argument that I've presented to you um, is, yeah, I think that's a good argument, but it's not the only argument. I have a, a, a different argument which is additional to your argument to the argument that I presented. Um, so, uh, and that argument is that we are violating the rights of the poor. Um, and he says here this narrower view 
This is uh, from the article that's in your uh, essential reading. Um, human rights violations are crimes actively committed by particular human agents who should be identified and then be persuaded to change their ways or else stopped. So he's sensitive to this criticism that um, somehow or other there has to be some connection um, between what some human beings are doing that violates the rights of the poor. So the question then is, well, what could this be if we're talking about global poverty, um, given the, the distances and the apparent lack of interaction between us and them? And he draws a distinction here between two kinds of human rights violations. He says a neglected distinction often. Um, interactional ones are the ones that I've been talking about that we would most naturally think of. So, for example, if I'm part of a, uh, a, a militia that uh, rampages through the country, seizing the crops of peasants, then obviously that's an interactional situation. I've done things to others that uh, I intend, in this case, to deprive them of their human rights. Or certainly I foresee that having taken their, their property, they'll be, they'll be hungry. And there are a variety of other things like that. But he says we should also not forget that there could be institutional uh, human rights violations. We could have designed or we could be imposing institutional arrangements that we intend, although in fact he's going to focus more on foresee or should foresee, will avoidably deprive them of their human rights. So he says we should look at the institutional arrangements that we have set up um, and that do these things. 